woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Our topic this morning is the handwriting on the wall. And we are, of course, reading the fifth chapter of, of Daniel. And as we now turn there to Daniel chapter 5, we look at some of the uh, the implication of it. And of course, as you look in Daniel 5 and remember, you know that this is the, the favorite story, a favorite story that you may have had as a child or growing up uh, of the handwriting on the wall and, and how this bloodless hand came out and began to trace on the wall in the middle of, a, of, the, of the palace hall. Words uh, etched in fire, as it were, that, that illuminated, that spoke of the downfall of a nation, the ending of an empire, of a dynasty coming to its end and the response that was there and how God really deals with nations, how God deals with men, is one piece that we're looking at in this chapter. In the overall context of Daniel, we're seeing the, the rise and fall of nations, how God handles and works with various nations to perform his will. And now in chapter 5, we're seeing in particular how nations or how individuals can cross the boundaries of grace, how they can go across the boundaries of divine forbearance and push the envelope too far in the results and the response of heaven. As we consider that and we look in the uh, fifth chapter of Daniel and starting in verse 1, we'll read about a man by the name of Belshazzar. The Bible tells us in Daniel 5 and verse 1 that Belshazzar the king, he made a great feast unto a thousand of his lords. Belshazzar in history, for a number of years, People doubted his existence. When I say people doubted his existence, of course, I don't mean people who read the Bible and, and, and were believers in the Bible in terms of just the simplicity of it. I've shared before that when we read the scriptures, we have to come to it with the basic understanding that, that, that it is God's word. And we will trust it, we will believe it, even though we may not understand all of it. Even though we cannot explain various portions of it. But there's a fundamental faith that rests in that says that, that this is God's word and it is not left to me and my opinion to determine if it's valid. Rather, it is valid because God said so. It is valid based upon the authority of scripture. It is valid based upon the, the consistency of scripture. It is valid based upon the historical veracity and the accuracy of history. It is valid based upon the fact that this book, like no other book, that it can change men's hearts, that it can make the drunk sober, it can make the profane um, reverent, it can make the, it, the, the, the godless godly. It is able to speak miracles and to be able to bring life, again, not of its own accord, but because the spirit of the living God takes these words, words that are written by men, but divinely inspired and attuned to the mind of God, able to then transform the heart of any man and woman or child that would heed those warnings, heed the instruction, and be blessed by it. So again, not, not a normal word, but the word of God, the word of the living God. So it is a living book, a living Bible, a living testament of these things. And so when we read it then as believers, we come to it understanding that there are some things that we will not grasp. So with the humility of a child, we face the scriptures knowing that the author of the scriptures is not man, but the author of the scriptures is God. And in order to be able to penetrate and to understand the things of God, then we don't need the understanding of man, but we need, as it were, God to imbue us with understanding. Because the most simple, simple things without divine understanding will twist. And the most complex things without divine understanding we will make even more complex. Critics have read Daniel in the, in the Bible, and they looked at Belshazzar as one of those mythical, ele, mythical persons uh, that there were no historical documents that spoke of. And, and there have been numbers of persons and so forth or events that have been spoken in the Bible that, that people go back to history. And there's nothing wrong with history to be able to attest. History is not in conflict with the Bible. 
Science, by the way, is not in conflict with the Bible. True science supports the Bible. It's just the same as history. True history, it supports the Bible. Like if you, if you selectively look at pieces and so forth, then there's a problem. But rightly understood, science supports the Bible. Rightly understood, history supports the Bible. Now, are there things still that you cannot create and understand? Absolutely. And yet there's that element of faith that must step in. And so as believers, we step in and we know even though history may not be able to attest to everything that is there, if it is recorded and we believe that it is recorded uh, for a divine purpose and we will trust in it for its accuracy. That stated, Belshazzar was a man that many historians believe did not exist. As I look back at the uh, texts that has, have survived for centuries, yea, even millennia, they could find things written of Nebuchadnezzar. They could find things written of Nebuchadnezzar. But nothing was there about Belshazzar. So who was he? And so they gave various interpretations as to who they thought he may, may have been. Uh, perhaps a, an alias. Maybe he didn't exist. Maybe it was somebody else. So no one quite knew who he was. And then in the 19th century, archaeologists came across cuneiform texts that began to talk about Belshazzar. And so all it did really is it confirmed what the Bible had written centuries ago. So to, to, to believers then, uh, it, it's, it's not like a benefit um, that it would make me now believe the story because I believe the story even before the scientists or the, uh, the archaeologists were able to, to record it and to find evidence for it. But for those that did not believe, if it can be used as a source to help, then I praise God for it. But at the same time, again, you will not find evidence. Like, we won't find, you're not going to find the well or the fish that swallowed Jonah. You can look for it, uh, but you're not, you know, even if you, you find skeletons, you're not going to know that this was the, the fish that swallowed Jonah. Nor will you find the furnace that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into. You're not going to find the den that Daniel uh, was cast into. Now, somebody might go over in uh, that part of the world in Iraq, and if they said that they found a, you know, a pit, and there were some lion's bones in there and so forth, and they found some human remains. And I know some people would be quick to say, that's got to be... There's got to be where Daniel was. You know, not necessarily. And some people, that would bolster their faith to believe now the story as to, well, maybe it could have taken place. Maybe it did take place because they have evidence. Well, again, evidence cannot be used as a sole criterion, a criteria whereby to base our faith on. If we want all evidence to base faith on, then that is not faith. In fact, it is just the opposite of what faith is because the Bible tells us that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. And so if, if criteria or evidence is what I am basing my faith on as such, um, then that, I would submit then that is not what faith is. Now, faith is built up upon certainly evidence of things. We read the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so God gives us ample evidence whereby to be able to base faith. But when we look at these stories, there'll be many a stories that we'll look at. We will not have the, the, the data around it. We will not have the archaeological evidence. We will not have the scientists or the spade to be able to confirm. When we do, it's great. Okay, but, but in our belief, uh, we don't want our belief to be based solely on, I'll only believe it if. I'll believe it when. But rather our faith is based upon a simple, a simple approach. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. And so the scientists may come back and they may cavil. They may argue back and forth. They may disagree. And they, and they can have at it. You know, they can fight. And from now into doomsday, whether or not they believe that Jesus could have been born of a virgin birth. Well, they, they, can, they can entertain that notion that they will. But God already said that he was. They, they can debate back and forth that they believe that the world will end in nuclear catastrophe. 
if it will be a global famine, global pestilence. They can go back and forth all they want, but the Bible already said how this world shall end. They can spend billions of dollars doing research to find out, well, when you die, can you go into a different place? They can debate that issue back and forth from here until the cows come home, but, but God has already said that the living know that they shall die and the dead know not anything. And so they can work it out amongst themselves, but it already is, should be settled then in the minds and hearts of believers. And so when we look at this story of Belshazzar, again, regardless of if evidence attests to it and other historical documents History is great, but the Bible has also contained it in sacred written. So when we read about Belshazzar making this feast, for years people thought he, he did not exist. And so when the claim was given that he would make Daniel the third ruler in the kingdom, there's always a question, well, how would, why would he make Daniel the third ruler? Maybe he was first, maybe the, the, the wife was second, and then maybe Daniel was third. There was this complexity of issues around it. But we'll see how it makes sense as we look at it. Belshazzar, whose Babylonian name uh, means uh, may Baal protect the king. Uh, Baal protect the king. He was the firstborn son of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the, and the last king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. History records that Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, was the last ruler of Babylon. From historical records, uh, his father, his father meaning Belshazzar, his father was in Lebanon recovering from an illness. And in this time period was he left and he was away from Babylon recovering from an illness, he made his son, who is Belshazzar, a co-regent, simply a co-ruler. Okay, so just in simple math, mathematical formula, we have one ruler plus another ruler equals two rulers. So Nebuchadnezzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is the father of Belshazzar. So Nebuchadnezzar has died, and he has left his empire in the hands of his son, and the son is sharing the throne with his grandson. Inspiration says that Belshazzar came into royalty or came into the royal throne at the age of 15. And so at this age, he began to uh, uh, influence the affairs of the, of the state. And so um, later on, his father, becoming sick, uh, moved over or went to Lebanon to recover from an illness. And while, he, while there in, in this area, they had a threat coming from the east. And the threat that they had coming from the east was Cyrus and Chosrus. Uh, they were Persian and Medes coming from the east, threatening the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar had left, and his son, Belshazzar, was in charge and in Babylon. In October the 10th, 539, the, the one, it was a, a decisive battle that took place in Sipar, and in this battle, uh, Belshazzar's troops lost. And after losing the battle um, that was there on October the 10th, 539, they came back into Babylon. Now, you keep in mind that his father, again, is, is the first. He is the second, or, and, or they're co-regents. His father is off in Lebanon. His father had been involved in battle. In, in fact, before his father had been, uh, in, uh, um, before his father had left here, one thing that he had done to turn the Babylonians against him, he had also removed some of the deities uh, from Babylon, the, the, some of the gods that were there. And this, this riled the priests that were there in Babylon in that they saw this affrontery done to uh, their, their national deities, that they were now being desecrated. They're not giving the honor that they should have and that they are now being set aside and given secondary placement. In the war that took place in the battle and the skirmish that happened on October the 10th, again, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, is not involved in this particular one. His son has lost his battle, and he retreats back to Babylon. And it's two days later on October the 12th, 539. People say, well, how do you come up with these dates? I don't come up with these dates, just, you know, 
historians come up with the dates and they translate them to our October and, and September and March and so forth because they didn't have months called March and April and May in this time period. They just look at the chronologies and then they, they affix them to, okay, well, based on our timing, this is when this would be, et cetera. So on October the, the 12th, 539, just two days later, is when our story takes place in the Bible, the, the, the making of Daniel chapter 5. So the backdrop of it is, is that the king has suffered this defeat at the hands of the Persians. And he retreats back to Babylon because there he knows that it's, it's safe. Um, Sipar is like 35, 39 miles away from Babylon. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, continues traveling further south. Uh, Belshazzar goes back home and just feels, okay, I'm back at home. I'm going to relax. I'm going to chill. And similar to his grandfather. His grandfather said, it's not this great Babylon that I have built. And so secure within the confines of Babylon, Belshazzar goes, we're not worrying about any enemies on the outside before he knows that Babylon has been built by his grandfather to become, to be self-sufficient. Remember, we, we talk of the, the moat that stretched around, the, the, the Euphrates that funneled through, the gates that were uh, virtually impenetrable, the walls that stretched 80 feet high that they would not face demise, they would not face defeat. So he goes back in there really secure and not worrying about those things that are on the outside because the, the Persians, the Medes, whoever else might come, they are really no match for him. Though, though he's lost this skirmish, there's no need to worry because he is back in this impenetrable city, and so he's not worried about anything taking place. And so he goes on this date on October the 12th, and he, according to the scriptures in verse 1, he makes a great feast unto a thousand of his lords. And he drank he drank wine before the thousand. So this is his mind, said, uh, a celebratory mind. He's coming back in uh, to, to have this feast. And he drinks wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, he commanded the, to bring the golden and the silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar. And, and when the scripture says his father, this is no mistake. Um, it is using fathers we would use as a grandfather. So it's not literally his father. This is his grandfather that is referring to. That uh, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might do what? Might drink therein. So the backdrop, if you understand, there's war and destruction. You, you've just left battle some 30 miles away. And, and, and to us, that doesn't seem that far. But in terms of uh, traveling then, that's a reasonable distance. Again, you can cover that in you know, a, a matter of a week easily. If you're marching 12 miles a day, then you'll be there in a couple of days. So we would say then, he shouldn't have been in this frame of mind to come back after losing a battle 30-some miles away, coming back home, and deciding to throw a party. But he does. He decides to throw a party, and throwing the party was not what the great offense was. It is what this frame of mind leads him to when the Bible says that he began to drink wine um, before the thousand. And so as he is drinking wine, it says in verse 2, then that uh, according to... Uh, the ESV, it says that under the influence of wine. So it is not supposing that he took a sip and he makes a decision. It's not supposing that he finished up his meal and he had a, a, a drink of wine. But he is intoxicated by the beverage. He's intoxicated by these spirits. And, and under this influence, he comes up with the idea that he'll bring forth the vessels that his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, has taken from the place in Jerusalem, and that he'll drink out of them himself. He is setting himself up in arrogance. He's setting himself up in boasting, going beyond, presuming beyond what his father or his grandfather would do. Now, the Bible says further in Proverbs 31, verse 4 and 5, it says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest what happened, lest they drink and they forget what? the law, and they pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So there's a warning that is there in Proverbs that, that if rulers are drinking, if they are, are intoxicated, they're going to forget law. They're going to forget judgment. They're going to forget what is right, and they will pervert the judgment of the afflicted. You have to be in your right frame of mind 
to be able to, to rule, you have to be in your right frame of mind to be able to execute and to bring forth the commands and the claims of God. So don't, don't drink wine. It is not for princes and kings to drink because something bad can happen from it. And I would submit to you that something bad did happen from it. It is not only in the case of, of wine, but today we have various, um, various drugs that people are under the influence of. Today, they, it is customary and it is common for people to be under the influence of a, of a plethora of different drugs. And, and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. It is acceptable, it is common for people to be under the influence of something to use it. And they don't feel they're under the influence of it, they just feel that they're using it. Alcohol is destructive in all of its courses, we, we can see. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. Though billions are spent in the industry, they find different ways. There are seltzer waters that are infused with a little bit of alcohol, with alcohol to be able to take. I saw the other day that one company came out and they said that they, will, they now have a, a cannabis base drink, a soft drink, that's infused with a little bit of with cannabis, and some, which, of course, the main ingredient would be THC. So the people would be able to take, and I know that some people would say, well, well, God made, made uh, cannabis, God made the um, herb, and it's fine. Well, I would submit God made mountains, too. He made waterfalls. Now, you're going to be dumb enough to go up and to jump off of one and to say, you know, I'm, I'm talking about extremely high. You know, you, would you go to El Capitan? Would you go to, uh, to some high peak in Yosemite and say, well, God made this, and so I'm just going to jump off? No, you're going to use some common sense and understanding and say, you know, I, I want to live, not die. But the influence of them, it perverts the judgment of man. It clouds their thinking so that normal things that you would do, you find yourself not doing, and things that you would normally have the discretion and the understanding not to do, you find yourself doing. So that if we look at, 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 at Belshazzar, under normal circumstances, he may have been a good fellow, you know, as far as rulers go. But now because he has become tipsy, because he is, he is drunk of the wine, because his mind cells or, or brain cells are not functioning in their normal capacity, his judgment is perverted, and so he makes the claim, and, and he comes up with an idea, and, and maybe in coming forth with this idea, he doesn't feel there's anything wrong with it. And that's one of the problems, again, with intoxicants, is people lose the sense of what is right and what's wrong. They don't see anything wrong with doing this. And what he may have shuddered from doing, being sober, he gladly participates in being inebriated. And he has the idea and says, well, let's go, let's go and take in the, the vessels that, that have been brought in from Jerusalem. And let's make a feast and let's make a toast and let's dedicate these. And not only does he do it for himself, but he wants others to participate in what he has done or what he plans to do. Contrary to this, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 17, it speaks a blessing. It says, blessed are you, O land, when your king is a son of nobles. And when your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Belshazzar makes a decision, though contrary uh, to this, in uh, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 11. Uh, continuing, it says, and that whoredom, that wine, and new wine take away the understanding. This trifecta, this unholy trifecta, is what is impacting Belshazzar. Prophets and Kings describes it as a, as a scene of revelry, as an as a, as a unrighteous orgy of sorts, of people coming together involved in whoredom and wine and new wine, and he has no understanding whatsoever as it comes to the, the things that belong unto God. And so he calls for that these be brought unto him, and whoever the servants are, they go and they bring them back. They, 
Let's do what the king has asked. They bring back these vessels and, and then return them back unto them. It says in verse 4 that they drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver and brass and iron and wood and stone. And verse 5 is where things stop. It's a few minutes of, of pleasure and then the rest of the chapter is devoted to a lifetime of agony that he receives. In verse 5 it says, The same hour that fingers of a man's hand, they appeared and they wrote, Opposite the lamp stand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And then the king's countenance changed. His thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loose and his knees smote one against another. In your minds, I consider that the king ruling Babylon. He's just left the battle that he has lost, and he comes back in, and he is having a feast just to wash away his sorrows. And now he's drunk and inebriated, and he decides to bring in the vessels, and, and things are going well. It's going to be a party like any other party, but maybe in some respects, this party is going to be the, um, the, the granddaddy of them all. That he's pushed to bring in the vessels that belong to God, and they, they come in, and they... Uh, pour in the goblets and the, the chalices wine. And he holds them up and he's drinking. And as he's drinking, then out of nowhere, a hen writes on, on, on a wall. Now, it would have been, you would have been scared enough if it just was writing on the wall. But, but to see like a, a hen and nothing else tracing on the wall. Now, I would imagine that this probably would not have been small writing, but, you know, pretty large writing. We don't have any insight as to the, the diameter and the, the measurements and the metrics and so forth, but I don't think it was small writing. I think it was pretty large for people to be able to see. And this writing appeared upon the wall, and they, they look at this, and as the king sees it, he, he doesn't understand what it is, but, again, the sight itself was enough to, to sober him up pretty quickly. You know, you talk about people who are drink, drunk, say, you know, splash water in your face, drink some coffee. Belshazzar didn't do any of that. Just that this sobered him up enough. Right? He looks at this and says, you know, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's not good. And so he stops instantly what he is doing, and now he sobers up, and the Bible says that his loins were loose. And, and I had been told that 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 meant that he had used the restroom on himself. And I looked it up, and it's nothing about using the restroom. It just meant his legs were weak. And his knees smote against another. So, so the idea is that, okay, his legs are weak, that he's, he's not, you know, like, okay, I need to sit down. You've been somewhere, you know, your legs are tired. You're like, okay, I just need to sit down. Now, he is partying, having a good time. His legs aren't weak before. But when he sees his handwriting on the wall, not knowing what it means and, and per, understanding that this is maybe some omen of some type. Now, whatever it is, it, this can't be have a nice day. You're doing good. So he sits down, and as he sits down, his, his knees begin to hit one against another. That means, you know, you're shaking with fear. What does this writing mean that he sees that's on the wall? What, is it, what, what does it pretend? And again, the ancients, and, and anybody for that matter, if you saw, I mean, if you saw writing on the wall now, I, I, I venture to say all of us would be afraid. Because you would, first you wonder, okay, well, is that the devil or is that God? That's going to be like the, probably the first thing that you're going to start thinking. And you, you are probably not going to try to stick around and figure out what, which one it is. You're out of here. So he sees this writing there, but he is, he is, as it were, transfixed to figure out what does it say? What does it mean? What is the message that is there? And so it says that his thoughts were troubled and his knees smote against another. And so the king then calls in the astrologers and the soothsayers and so forth. He, he asks them to come in. And he says, tell me what the, the meaning of this is. And so whatever is written out, they're able to read it. You know, it's not a question of reading it. It's about being able to understand it. What is the meaning behind it? Because these are very simple words that are written there, which we'll see later on. He promises that he will promote them to uh, 
the third ruler in the kingdom. And again, that's important because his father is the first. He's the second co-regent. So whoever is able to decipher this, he's going to promote to the third. That's like the highest position that he's able to afford given the, the, the hierarchy that existed at that time. And so all the wise men in verse 8, this says they, these wise men, they came, but they couldn't tell the king what was written. Nor could they make known the, to the king the interpretation thereof. And so the king was greatly troubled. His countenance was changed and his lords were astonished and the queen came in, the queen mother. And so many commentaries suggested this may have been his grandmother. Nebuchadnezzar's wife comes in. And she looks at the situation and says, there is a man. There is a man with whom the dwelling of the, the spirit of the holy gods is. And in the days of your father, again, grandfather, in the days of your father, that this man had wisdom and understanding and might and knowledge, and he came and he made known unto your father some of the mysteries that perplexed him. Why don't you call this man to come forth and he can share perhaps with you what he shared with your father? And so he calls forth Daniel to come uh, and to interpret the dream. And so in verse 13, it says, Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spake unto Daniel and said, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain signs or enigmas. Now if you can read to the writing and make known to me its interpretation, then you will be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now, I would imagine in this particular case, Daniel came in and God gave him understanding. And he hears what this is what the offer is, that you're going to be the third ruler in the kingdom. I'm going to give you these things. I will promote you uh, to, to, and, and I will elevate you so that you will be the third ruler in the kingdom. And Daniel says, keep your gifts for yourself and let your reward be to another. But I'm going to tell you what the writing is upon the wall. And I'll make known the interpretation thereof. I'm not interested in what you're able um, to offer. I'm going to give you an understanding of what, what God has said. And he takes a, a, a note of what has taken place and he comes in and he gives them the understanding. This is what is written. I'm not, not concerned about uh, promotion. I'm not concerned about what you're able to offer. I've come as, as a citizen being beckoned to come and to interpret. And because my God is involved, I'm going to come and give you the understanding as to what is written there. And so he begins to speak and to elaborate upon what he sees. But before that, he says, that, King, your father received the kingdom from God. And he had glory and honor and majesty. And everybody worshipped him. Whoever, in verse 19, whomsoever he would, he executed. And whomsoever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. This is what, uh, how his grandfather was. But he talks about the experience that his grandfather had. That when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, then he lost everything. And when they took his glory from him, he was made like a wild beast of the earth, and he went over until seven times until a man's heart was given to him, until he recognized that God was the ruler, not only in the affairs of Babylon, but God wanted to be ruler in his own personal affairs. And King, you knew all this, and yet you haven't learned from the mistakes of your father. So what am I to say? 
In Prophets and Kings, we, we read this. It says, Through the folly and weakness of Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, proud Babylon was soon to fall. Admitted in his youth to a share in kingly authority, Belshazzar gloried in his power and lifted up his heart against the God of heaven. Many had been his opportunities to know the divine will and to understand his responsibility of rendering obedience thereto. He had known of his grandfather's banishment by the decree of God from the society of men, and he was familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and miraculous restoration. But Belshazzar allowed the love of pleasure and self-glorification to efface the lessons that he should never have forgotten. He wasted the opportunities graciously granted him and neglected to use the means within his reach for becoming more fully acquainted with truth. That which Nebuchadnezzar had finally gained at the cost of untold suffering and humiliation, Belshazzar passed by with indifference. Belshazzar should have learned then from the mistakes of his, of his father, Nebuchadnezzar. He would have been able to see that, okay, that, that God is real, and that God does have a plan. God has a purpose that you can only push God so far before God may intervene. If I would learn from the folly and mistakes of my, of my grandfather and to change and to amend my ways, but, but he does not, and so he is pushed to, to this precipice of his own choosing. It further says in page 529, it says, The prophet first reminded Belshazzar of matters with which he was familiar, but which had not taught him the lesson of humility that might have saved him. He spoke of Nebuchadnezzar's sin and fall and of the Lord's dealings with him, the dominion and glory bestowed upon him, the divine judgment for his pride and his subsequent acknowledgement of the power and mercy of the God of Israel. And then in bold and emphatic words, he rebuked Belshazzar for his great wickedness. He held the king's sin up before him, showing him the lessons that he might have learned, but did not. Belshazzar had not read or write the experience of his grandfather, nor heeded the warnings of events so significant to himself. The opportunity of knowing and obeying the true God had been given him, but had not been taken to heart, and he was about to reap the consequence of his rebellion. So he in hearing then the word um, that was there, it is king, uh, you knew, you have been told, um, but you have not responded. In verse 22 of Daniel chapter 5, he says, but you his son, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, although you knew this. You have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought before the vassals, the vessels of his house, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines, you've drunk wine from them. So now again, please understand that, that, that Daniel does not condemn the king for having the feast. I'm not suggesting that the feast was fine. I'm not, not, this is not giving uh, an evidence or uh, uh, an excuse to say, hey, it was fine what you were doing. It was fine to just to get drunk, lose your mind, and what you're participating in. The issue primarily that Daniel was taking him the task over is that he has gone to take those things that belong to God and to use them in his secular and profane service. That he has crossed the line, that this is where he has crossed the line by blending or taking that which is religious and using it for a secular purpose. This is where you've now crossed this, this line. And please keep that in mind. It says, Belshazzar, while engaged in his sacrilegious feast, was not aware that he had guessed he had not invited. The God of heaven heard the praises bestowed upon vessels of gold and silver. He saw the desecration of that which had been dedicated to him by holy consecration applied to profane and licentious purposes. It is a truth which should make every one of us weep that those living in these last days upon the ends of the world are come are far more guilty than was Belshazzar. This is possible in many ways. When men who have taken upon themselves the vows of consecration devote all their powers to the sacred service of God, when they occupy the position of expositors of Bible truth and have received the solemn charge, 
When God and the angels are summoned as witnesses to the solemn dedication of soul, body, and spirit to God's service, then shall these men who minister in a most holy office desecrate their God-given powers to unholy purposes? Shall the sacred vessel whom God is to use for a high and holy work be dragged from his lofty controlling sphere to administer to a debasing lust? Is not this idol worship of the most degrading kind? The lips uttering praises and adoring, adoring a sinful human being, pouring forth expressions of ravishing tenderness and adulation, which alone, being alone to God, the power is given to God in solemn consecration and ministering to a harlot. For any woman who will allow the addresses of another man than her husband, who will listen to his advances and whose ears will be pleased with the outpouring of lavish words of affection, of adoration, of endearment, is an adulteress and in Harlan. Wait a minute. That, that's, we're talking of a couple of things there. She's talking here in the context then of, of, of ministers then who are um, preying upon the congregation. Th that we have something that is even worse than Belshazzar in taking the vessels that belong in the service of God now and using them for profane purposes, but, but crossing the line that, that to, today then that you would have ministers of the gospel who will go into congregants and who will pour forth praises and speak forth words of adulation. And she's saying, well, well the woman then that listens to this, and may I interject then uh, today, because today is a little crazy, even the men that will listen to this, is on dangerous territory and dangerous ground. They took that which was holy and used for an uncommon or secular purpose. And I would submit today that, again, that men today are doing much the same, using that which is holy, but using for a secular and a common purpose. And so when, when men do that, there comes a point in which God then interposes, God intervenes, God says that enough is enough. And we know not when that shall be, but we read in the book of Psalms uh, that, yes, there will come a time in which God will work. In Psalms 119, the 126 verse, we read, it is time for thee, Lord, to work. For they have made void thy law. This imprecation of David that God, you need to rise and do something. That it is time for you to work for they have made void thy law. There is only so far that mercy will go. Only so far that forbearance will take. And so Belshazzar, he crosses this boundary just on a normal day. Pushes the line uh, too far. And so today, men as well, women as well, will push the line too far. But we see this theme repeated in Babylon. For it's in Daniel chapter 5 that in summary then that at the conclusion of it, he tells them that this is what the interpretation is. That this is why God has done this. That you have taken these things, you've drunk wine in them, and you've praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and bronze as though that they are saviors, as though they are deliverers. But you didn't forget, you have forgotten. You've forgotten to give glory to God. And that God's worship alone is, is pure. That he cannot be brought down to the level of the brutes and the beasts and idols that you've formed and fashioned with your own hands. That there is a God, even though you may have forgotten that God is still high, that he is still holy, and that he is still exalted. And so this is why he has written this. And this is what the meaning is. Meany, meany, tickle, you farson. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You've been weighed in the balances and you've been found wanting. Your kingdom is now given to the Medes and to the Persians. As Daniel gives these words already, uh, Cyrus's armies are coming in. Now there's some debate amongst some people to say, well, what happened and so forth. Well, when you look at the historical record, the historical record indicates that, that Cyrus had drained the river Euphrates. You can reference that in Isaiah chapter 44 and Isaiah chapter 45. They had drained the river Euphrates so that it would not uh, feed into Babylon so that his troops would be able to march in. One writer says that, that the, a lot of the en enmity that Cyrus had was that his favorite horse drowned in the river. And he was so enraged that his favorite horse drowned in the river that he said, well, you know what? This is not going to be a mighty river anymore. I'm going to make it like a little... Um, stream. You know, you, you've gone through the house and like, you know, walked and hit your foot on the, the chair or the bed and you may get upset and turn around and kick the bed again. Well, that's just what he did. You know, 
It's like, I'm going to take it out on this river. You killed my favorite horse, you'll not be a river anymore. And so he begins to drain it now. Now, now again, when men do things, they often don't know that they are but fulfilling the plan and the purposes of the Almighty. Isaiah 44 said that the river would be, would be dry. The two-leather gate would not be shut, and so uh, he drains the river, uh, and so it makes it where they're able to march through. Now, there were some soldiers that marched on the inside coming through on the bottom, uh, going in, and, and as they came into the palace, according to what you read in Daniel chapter 5, they came to Belshazzar, and Belshazzar was slain. But by and large, the city would fall without significant bloodshed. It was not like the city just put up a, a, a big fight against the Persians as they came in. By and large, the city surrendered. They opened up the gates so that people would be able to come in. They were, not, they were not trying to lose their lives in the downfall. But Belshazzar died that night. He dies there after hearing the interpretation, the oration of Daniel, telling, letting him know this is what shall be. Now, now had he understood and known all these things had been prophesied before. Now let's look at Isaiah quickly, Isaiah chapter 23. I also have it on the uh, overhead for convenience. Isaiah says this. Uh, you, you know of Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45, but you can also read Isaiah chapter 23. Uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they also speak of Babylon being the pride of nations. It says in Isaiah uh, verse 1, that the burden of the desert of the sea, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Uh, putting it another way, what goes around comes around. All right? The, the, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously. Whatever you sow, you're also going to reap. The spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege O Media. This is talking about Babylon. What's going to happen to Babylon, by the way? All the sign thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my lowings filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it, Isaiah says. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Isaiah writes of Babylon's fall, of Babylon's destruction here, um, that Elam and Media are going to go up, that they're going to spoil the spoiler. Keep in mind, Babylon was used to punish other nations, and now other nations come along to punish Babylon. Media Persia comes along, and, and Isaiah says that, that my, heart, my heart panted. Fearfulness has affrighted me. The night of my pleasure has been turned into fear into me. Belshazzar's night of feasting is now turned into fear into him. Prepare the table, watch in the high tower. Eat, drink ye, arise ye princes, and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go set a watchman, and let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses, and a chariot of camels. And he hearkened diligently with much heed, and he cried, A lion. My Lord, I stand continually upon the watch tower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen. Is fallen. Now, you remember that automatically from another book in the Bible, Revelation. For, and all the graven images of her God, see, have broken into the ground. Uh, Isaiah predicted and talked about Babylon's fall and how it would fall. This night of feasting uh, would instantly be turned. From the book, uh, uh, Inspiration, I think it's Royal and Redemption. It's, uh, it says, in the, that last night of, of insane folly, Belshazzar and his lords had filled up the measure of the Chaldean kingdom's guilt. No longer could God's restraining hand hold out the impending evil. We would have healed Babylon, God declared of those whose judgment was now reaching unto heaven. But she is not healed. Please keep in mind that God is, 
seeking always to save. He's seeking to, be, to redeem. And so a Babylon, it, she was not so incorrigible, incapable of being saved, but she would not. For he says, I, we would have healed you, but she is not healed by her own choice, her own choosing. God had found, finally found it necessary to pass the irrevocable sentence. Belshazzar's kingdom was to pass into others' hands. More than a century before, inspiration had foretold that the night of pleasure in Isaiah chapter 21, verse 4, during which king and counselors would, would blaspheme God, would suddenly be changed into a time of fear and destruction. And now, while still in the festival hall, the king is informed that his city is taken by the enemy. Even while he and his nobles were drinking from the sacred vessels and praising their gods of silver and gold, the Medes and Persians, having diverted the Euphrates out of its channel, were marching into the heart of the unguarded city. The army of Cyrus now stood under the walls of the palace. The city was filled with the soldiers of the enemies like a swarm of locusts, and their triumphant shouts could be heard above the despairing cries of the astonished party goers. Revelation chapter 18, verse 2 and verse 3, uh, we read that Babylon again shall fall. The Bible says in verse 1 that there's a mighty angel that comes down from earth, having enlightened the earth with its glory. In verse 2 and 3 says in Babylon, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit in the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Why? Because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. See, ancient Babylon, um, the, the time it fell when it crossed the line is it took those vessels that belonged to God and it crossed and went too far. It made it appear as though that this is totally all right. This is okay. This is acceptable. Spiritual Babylon will, fall, will, will follow in the same footsteps of ancient Babylon of looking at the vessels of those things that belong to God, or the sacred oracles of God, i.e. the law of God, and saying unto man that it's okay, that you can trample it underfoot, that there's no penalty whatsoever. And offering to men then to take it, and why is she doing this? She's doing this because she herself is intoxicated uh, with false wine, and it has inebriated her, and she feels that this is okay, and she influences men to do just the same, and just as virily, as men will then seek to then trample upon the law of God and to exalt a spurious Sabbath in place of the law of God. Again, that handwriting is going to come upon the wall, but again, not in writing that people are able to see, but a judgment that is written upon the wall, symbolizing meany, meany, tuggle, you farson, that you, your kingdom is divided, that it is numbered, that you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And now judgment is pronounced and a deliverer is going to come. Cyrus is spoken of in the scriptures in Isaiah chapter 44 and in chapter 45 as, as, as a savior, as the anointed one. All this prefigures in the work of Christ as the Messiah, of him coming in from the east, similar in language from what we see in Isaiah and Daniel, that he is going to be the one to come back uh, from the east, the kings of the east, coming back then to deliver his people who have been in spiritual Babylon, those who were like Daniel. Daniel was not consumed. Daniel was not slain. They had put on him the, the, the chain of gold, but, but he was not a citizen, as it were, of that earthly kingdom. His citizenship was written in heaven, and so he is now protected, he is now kept, and so this spiritual savior, uh, Cyrus, comes in to bring deliverance. So Christ will come in to bring forth deliverance, and Babylon will sit thinking it will know no end, and its destruction will come almost overnight. And so spiritual Babylon also will sit and think that it knows no end, but its destruction will come overnight. It will not recognize as literal Babylon that it has gone too far. But spiritual Daniel, if you please, will recognize when seeing the boundary being passed, will be able to speak forth and say, it's gone too far. A message of warning would then go out to the world for those who will not know, those who do not know, um, that destruction is coming. 
and that deliverance is on the way. And then the rest of what we see is applicable in Daniel chapter 5 of the Euphrates. You find the exact same parallels in the book of Revelation that the Euphrates River is now drained. The people begin to withdraw their support and Babylon is destroyed and righteousness, eternal righteousness, will come in and will endure um, forever. I pray that God may help us uh, so that in these days when men and women are crossing the boundaries, that we'll be safe on the other side, kept and claimed again by the promises and by the authority of his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for the moments that we've been able to have to be able to look at this chapter again. Um, we pray, God, that you would help us so that we will not uh, become desensitized by this world, that we would clearly see that there's a difference between what is sacred and what is, is common, and those things that are sacred and that belong unto you, that they will be a part of us in our character, and that we will not seek to, uh, to mingle or intermingle um, the things that are vile and profane, but rather we would cast them forth out of our hearts, cast them forth out of our lives, recognizing that they have no place in building for eternity. Again, I pray your blessing upon us. Forgive us of all of our sins, we pray in Jesus' name.